Hi, I'm Tom DeRosa from Creation Studies Institute. We're here tonight with our monthly, we try to do these monthly, monthly a seminar fellowship created in God's image, March 22nd at 7 p.m. We're a little bit late, but we're here and we, we praise God for that. We're going to open with some prayer and then we'll get started. Thank you for your patience. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We acknowledge you, Jesus. We know that you're ever present. You're here with us. And because we are created in your image, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, Lord. We are just, um, we're able to have communion with you, have relationship with you. And we just uh, know that you love us so much. Uh, we can't even imagine it. But for us, for you to create a place for us on this earth, in this place, in this universe, and then uh, come down and save us, it's just an amazing, amazing thought. And so, Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor. We ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit be upon us this evening and that whatever we do, we do it in your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, they said, amen, amen, amen. I'm here at the South Florida Bible College. Our Creation Studies Institute's museum is located we're on campus. So that's what you see. You see behind me, you see the dinosaurs, and that's our museum. And I'm right here in the, what we call the fellowship area. We're giving our talk. So created in God's image, and that, I think, needs to be um, the, the key object that we're going to be talking about now. Now, um, I need to make an announcement, and that announcement is for next week. Oh, there's some children in the background. I don't know where they came. They're in my slide. How did they get there? Well, you know, this is God's image, right? <laughs> I look at kids. Uh, yeah, they're God's image. Okay. Um, so... Um, next, in May, our next fellowship seminar is going to be May 17th. This is an announcement. Um, we're going to be looking at Eight Man Hoax, and it's going to be exposed with a documentary film by Dr. Carl Werner. Dr. Carl Werner is a medical doctor and has went to many different places uh, around the world. He's interviewed many paleontologists and curators at, at these popular and very prestigious museums and he's asked them questions about he did one with evolution on the on on transitionals and so on that was his first set of movies and and presentations and publications this one he's said he spent several years researching this topic i believe it's more than several years it, it's in the 10s and 15s i believe and he went to different continents around the world uh, and visited these these very prestigious museums and asked some very important questions about the eight man fossils. And he presents this in an eight part series. We're going to have only one part. It's 50 minutes, but I think it's going to you're going to see things that are so unbelievable when you look in terms of how this idea of eight men ever came to be and how literally it's been fortified with 150 different hoax. And we're going to go through some of them. And uh, on this episode next May, we're going to be talking about the scientists hiding fossils and eight man tools. Very, very interesting. And I think you'll uh, appreciate the fact that God is with us. God has created us as we're going to go over tonight. Uh, and, and literally he's created us in his image. And that, to me, is a very, very profound idea, concept. And when we look at what's going on in the world today and how that concept, that idea, that, that you know, we look at the idea of creation. Creation is the top miracle of all miracles. God created everything, right? He created all the universe. And then the second, I think, miracle goes up there is that he created us to share his creation. And then we're created in his image. And that is a fantastic miracle of all miracles. And then, of course, we have the resurrection for our faith and belief in Jesus Christ for our salvation. So I think that's important. So, uh, again, May 17th, 2024, 7 p.m. And we're going to be doing that again, both seminar and here at the college. So tonight, what we want to discuss in this uh, session, we want to discuss first, part one, God's word. I, I want to make sure we're rooted in that. Then two, evolution's dogma in the image of ape. I want 
share some of these fossils with you that were claimed to be uh, the idea that we came from apes. And so I'm, I'm going to share some bones with you and some context of wh where supposedly we came from. Uh, and then we talk about self-awareness in God's image. I think this is going to be a thing that I blew me away when I realized that self-awareness is being part of God's image. And then the human brain and language. Language is fascinating. The fact that we can speak this language and we could articulate, we can, it's its just taking a look at the brain. It, it's a, just amazing to see that all translate. And then, then we have part five, we go into other man's distinctivenesses. And we're going to go over creativity, moral conscious, and emotional depth. Uh, I believe language is a very important uh, aspect, and also intelligence is part of our uniqueness. But we're going to get enough of that in the, the other four parts. So let's begin. We'll begin with God's Word, and we'll start here. There's a chronology in Genesis 1 and 2. The chronology, I believe, is very important. Is a historical narrative based on a literal progression of seven days. It's not just an occasion, an account of Israel. It declares a history of the universe, the entire world, uh, earth and its occupants. Extremely important for us to understand. Genesis is very foundational. We can't, how can we define ourselves if we don't define ourselves with his story, Christ's story, the story of us that's told in God's word? And it's very important that we know our origins. We don't know where we, we start from, how we know where we're going to go. So it's important to know our beginnings. And Genesis tells us that. It centers on God, the creator, who is mentioned first. The creation was very good, as started in Genesis 137. At the conclusion of the sixth day, it was very good. It mentions Five other times, it was good, it was good, and then he concludes, it was very good. Very important for us to understand. And then man is the apex of creation as indicated in the divine order of creation. I wondered about this. When you look at the creation, you see, like you see a staircase. You see that everything is made and created and man enters the creation, the final work of God to occupy and have dominion. He's going to be on the top of the ladder. The divine order is a succession of steps ascending upward till the final step when man is created. So everything else is created before him, his follow me. And that's that's God's plan. He wants to establish the creation so man can have dominion. God created man last in his divine order to demonstrate the infinite love of our creator. So he manifests himself by literally creating this whole creation. Uh, he manifests himself so we can see him through his creation. And then he puts us at the apex. And so we see, as we go through the day one, matter and time and space, we see separation the second day. Earth and oceans appear and the planets. So he separates the water from the water and creates the earth. And then we have the ocean, we have the plant, plants, and we begin to see life. And at that day, day three, we see things coming according to their kinds, according to their DNA. Then we go into day four, and we see the sun, the moon, and the stars. We see now the timepieces that keep our time, the 24-hour day. Now, God doesn't think of 24 hours. God thinks of constants. His time is constant. So I always say it's like an interval of time. An interval of time means that you go from one point of, to another point, and those points are in segments. Okay? So that's why it's important to keep that in mind. Okay? Then we have day five. Day five is fish and birds. And I used to think, oh, fish and birds. When you look at fish and birds, it's amazing to see all the different kinds. And we talk about fish. I need to remind you that it's the environment of the ocean and the water. That's where God created. He created things in niches so you can see them. It's important to see. And then, let's see what happened here. You good, Johnny? Okay. Then day six is animals, creeping, crawling things and animals. And then again, then, and then we hit man. Man is the last thing of God's creation. 
Unbelievable. And I look at that and I said, there it is. He creates everything before us and then we walk in. I don't know if you ever thought of that, but it's kind of neat. God creates a whole universe and then we walk in. And so that's kind of telling you the story, isn't it? That, yeah, he thinks a lot of us. He thinks well of us. He thinks good of us because we're created in his image. And we can see that right from the very beginning. Then in Genesis 126, 128, we see it really defined. It says, and God let man, let God said, let us make man in our image. Let me go back. Then God said, Genesis 1 is filled with then God said. You see, then God said, it said 10 times. So God said 10 times in Genesis 1. Follow me. God said, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said. Now, if you go back to John, in the beginning was what? Was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or is God. You see that? So we see that God's Word is emphasized. It is the thing. The Bible is God's Word. And God said in Genesis 10 times, and God said, God said. He was trying to tell us very clearly that it was his word that put this creation in the order that it proceeded in, in the order that he announced. Now, in day six, the last part of God's creation, he says, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You notice that I have these images in color code. So, I, I mean, I have the word image in, I have these words in color codes as you read this, and you'll see blue is, this, uh, it talks about dominion. Image is image, and you're going to see image appear again. It appears two times in Genesis 127. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So again, you see the word created. Create, created, created. Three times, bara. The Hebrew word bara three times talks about God creating man. Again, bara means out of nothing. We know that he used the dirt, but God has the presence of creating man. And the idea of creating man is very special because the word in Genesis, create bara, is used five times and three times just in this verse alone. Okay, so that's important. And then the word image. The word image is used three times from Genesis 126 and Genesis 127. You see it very clearly. Now let's take a look at the blue words. Here it comes. Genesis 128. So 126, we see that God as a Elohim, that's the word Elohim, that's God's in plural. So God let us. That's a that that's the idea that there was a commune. It was a there was people there. God uses plural sometimes to, end, uh, to make sure he understands majesty. In the Hebrew, it talks about majesty, but also it could talk about Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why not? We know God is a trinity. Then God blessed them in Genesis 28. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. He repeats what he did in 126 and summarizes it. Now, when you look at this, you see very clearly that not only did God create us in his image so we know who we are, but he also gave us a purpose. And the purpose is to have dominion over the fish of the sea, basically to have dominion over the earth. And that's what we see very clearly here. God's description of man. That God describes man's nature as the image of God made in his likeness in Genesis 126. The Hebrew word for man is Adam. Now, I don't know if you so the word Adam really means man. So when you hear the word Adam, you have to think, well, that's man. That's the word for man. Okay. And we'll see that. I'm going to get, get into that a little bit right here. Okay. The precious gift of the image of God. Let us make man in our image. This is when the Hebrew word for Elohim, uniplural, means God's three persons in one. Genesis 1 26, the term let us and ours, again repeating, means what? Three means it means a, a majesty, it means a court. It could mean the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Elohim is used in Hebrew, meaning plural. So in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew in Genesis, all the way in the Old Testament, 
El is a singular, Elohim is plural. Most of the times you hear Elohim, okay? The plural for God, Elohim. And then, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Again, the word image and the word create used three times mean something. And you could see very clearly by just the scripture and how it's spoken here, that man has a very special place. Now, I use this analogy. This is just, I got this from Henry Morris uh, some time ago. Henry Morris is the founder of the modern creation movement. So body like Christ, a mind like the father and a soul like the spirit. I'll go over that a little bit because I believe your triunity, your triune in, in body, mind, and spirit. And we'll go over that. I'll get into that. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 talks about spirit, talks about soul, and talks about body. It says, now may the God of, of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept uh, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see soul, spirit, body. So what are we? That's what we are. Spirit, soul, and I'm going to call that the mind, soul, and the body, okay? And then the spirit, soul, body set apart by Christ, blameless of sin. This is the first time in the New Testament that the tripartite triune, tripartite, being one person, is mentioned. We see that God created man in his image, the image of God, he created them. And here we go. Our image, who we are, our identity, lies not only in the image of God, but lies in male and female. Today's society is it's going crazy over this. And I believe it's going crazy because they're, they're very confused. They're very confused because they do not know the truth. The truth is in Jesus Christ. He set us free. The truth is Jesus Christ. And so in their domain, they have literally confused facts. You follow me? Facts come in one level and our mind is another level. And, and our decision making, what we like, where our personhood, everything is in that second box. Schaefer uh, says that that's the upper room. You see, we make decisions in that upper room. We may, we, we are a self, we have, we have our persona there, our person, our mind. I'm going to call that the mind, okay? I'm going to call that where our mind, soul reminds. That's not the spirit, the mind, soul. It's right there, okay? It's what God has given us as our individuality, okay? And we make decisions from that, okay? Then downstairs is the objective part. The third floor is Christ. And when Christ comes into us, everything gets united. We know that Jesus Christ is truth. So guess what? My viewpoint is a lot different than the world's viewpoints. Why? Because I believe in Jesus. I believe in the truth. Everything. All the rooms are aligned. You see, I, I could understand. I could understand reality. Because if you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have the truth. You don't have reality. And those that you're going to get fed misinformation all the way through. You make your own religion. Just had a kingdom conference down here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. They put on a kingdom conference. And I, I really enjoyed the speaking. And I learned that the new world, the way the world looks today at uh, at sex and the identity and so on, uh, is looking at it from a very confused point. They have their own gods. I thought atheism was a big thing, but now spiritualism is coming in. And spiritualism basically is that... Everybody has their own religion. Everybody can believe their own way. You follow me? You don't trump on that. I mean, you're, everybody has their own beliefs, their own set of beliefs, so they do what they want to do. And you don't, you don't mess around with that. You follow? But, but anyway, that's a whole way, another way of thinking. So um, we see that the first gift, I mean, a precious gift, was the, I meant the gift, the precious gift, the first woman. Adam's jubilance and evidence that he woke up from a deep sleep. He named his helpmate woman. Now, the DNA of that rib, okay, had to have an XX chromosome. You follow me? The XY chromosome is a man. So there was, something took place there where you had, uh, you had genetics, and that genetics 
you wind it up with a woman and a man. Okay. They must have been an exhilarating experience as for the first time he awakens to his perfect ma ma mate. The first woman of mankind would be called Eve by Adam. Now, interesting. Interesting. Who named Eve? Adam. Okay. She's the name means mother of life. Eve, Eve would be mother of the human race. Man can love man and love deeply. He does not love, does not know God, for God is love. And so we have a companion who we can love and cherish. I mean, not like God, but we can have some, a, a helpmate. And this is a beautiful experience. It's it's done very well in Genesis. I love it. it it's, it's, you know, hey, I've been married 54 years. I should know something about it, right? <laughs> okay. The precious gift, purpose and commission. God describes man with purpose in Genesis 1.28. God then gives a commission to man over the earth in Genesis 1.28. Then he says in a narrative in ancient, uh, this is the only narrative in ancient Near Eastern stories that give man created in his image with such a large commission. Okay, in ancient stories, we are the ones that stand out because we are to have commission over God's creation. So here's the position. See it? God, man, and creation. Now, I have to be careful. I need to put the earth in there. <laughs> because he did say the earth. He didn't say Mars. He didn't say Venus, did he? He said the earth. So how do you look at the space program, Tom DeRozan? Or better yet, how do you look at the space program? I don't see any significance of going to uh, putting man on Mars or moon. What I see is technology. As long as we're getting technology to mine the earth, that is fine. That's what's going to happen. Because the idea of going out anywhere else kind of defies what God has created here, isn't it? God's created a perfect place for us on this earth. And that's another story, another talk, why earth is so privileged as a place in the whole universe the oxygen the hydrogen the nitrogen i can go through the whole periodic table and have fun with that and show you how important it is and how god has literally uh, given us this beautiful place to live now i'm going to go to joe because i'm going to go to this verse joe 42 5 to get to this neat part see i've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. So what does that mean? Job is, re he in this part of his, his life, or this part of his, his testimony, he sees God at work. Now, you know that he being, he's being tried or tested. And at this particular point, he comes to the, to the position where he, really sees God. He sees God and he sees him by experiencing him. Because with Job, Job in chapter 38, it says, bring your, uh, it says, brace yourself like a man. I will question you, Job, and you shall answer me. Chapter 38 in Job is when God comes and speaks to him. And he asks him 77 questions. And of course, the dinosaurs come in there and the fire-breathing dragons come in there. So Job, at the end, 42.5 says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. In other words, Lord, I respect you. Uh, I'm a Jewish man. I'm a prophet. I've, I've read the scriptures. I, I, I make the sacrifices. I obey you. I, I honor you as my God. But now I experience you. I see you. And I think it's important for us to realize that because we're created in God's image, you follow me? We can experience the idea of the gospel. See, if you were an animal and you weren't created in God's image, you wouldn't be able to experience that. Because you're created in God's image, you can experience the gospel. You see, you're the only animal on earth that has faith. Because when I went to the atheist meeting many years ago, they were looking for reason for their beliefs. I, I met them. They were all walking in and we're all talking, and they said, I'm here 
to find a reason. And it was an atheist meeting. And, I, I, and they're all trying to find a reason. See, we have, there's a, there's a part of us always seeks out faith. We want to believe in something. That's how we're made. That's the third compartment, you see? That's the third compartment. That goes over. That's where the spirit lives. And, and you're looking and you're searching because you're creating God's image. And this is what, what it says in Romans 1, 16, 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Believes. We can believe. Okay? And, and there's a reason for this. I'm going to go into it in a moment. The, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it's written. The righteous shall live by faith. We have faith because we can experience, you follow me? God. That's what Job was saying. He experienced God. And so we have the faith. We understand that this is a dynamic place to live. And God, we can understand that Jesus Christ came and died for us, you see. We know the gospel. We know and we can understand this. You know, for another person to take our place is an amazing concept. You follow it's a concept that only image bearers can bear. And of course, God crowns man with honor and glory. He loves us so much that he crowns us with honor and glory. We see this in such a wonderful way. Okay, take a breath. We're in part two now. In the image of God, in the image of God. So what are uh, the image of an ape? Well, uh, when I was an atheist, I believed in this. My wife is sitting here. I went home and I would tell her that I came from an ape. I even told my mother that in the kitchen when I was going to college. And we had a big argument. And she said, son, that's so stupid. And I thought I was pretty smart. I was, you know, you know, I thought that I came to college and I was learning a lot of things. But I never really thought about this till I became a Christian, you see. Um, I, I know there are things told to us, for instance, are chimps humans? A little girl hugging a chimpanzee demonstrates how different humans and chimps look physically, but they are between 98 to 99 percent genetically identical. Was that true? No, it's not true. You see, um, there's a big problem with that. And we'll go through that uh, very quickly here. Um, Time Magazine, How We Became Human. I saw this magazine, Chicago, when I was on a trip in our Creation Studies Institute. We had to stop at Chicago. And this is when he came out in October. And I saw this Time magazine. I mean, it was all over this, this magazine sh shop. The whole place, the whole window had this, this head. He just repeated it, repeated it, repeated it, repeated it. <laughs> it says, how we became human. And now you look... And I asked my students about this when I came back. I said, let me ask you, do you see how we became human from the monkey to the baby? And they said, that's crazy. We don't look like that. <laughs> so it, it was a big assumption made. Now, you can't see the bottom. I made a circle, so I brought it up here. Chimps and humans share almost 99% of their DNA. New discoveries reveal how we can also um, alike be alike and yet be so different. The scientists keep reminding us, this is what I found inside the magazine as I read the article. A scientist, as scientists keep reminding us, evolution is a random process in which haphazard genetic changes interact with random environmental conditions, produce an organism somehow fitter than its fellows. Now, just think about that. It's a process of hap haphazard genetic changes interact is that science that, that's not controlled environment i have controls and variables when i do my science i set up my lab and my experiment this is crazy haphazard okay i, I don't see how you get order at haphazard okay it, it's so a random environmental conditions the the conditions were so random so we have another thing not only do we have a haphazard genetic changes we have random conditions changing all the time so uh, we've done this many, many times here in my seminars before. Statistics, this does not show. It, 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 there's no way you can get molecules to man. 
Absolutely not. Chances are impossible. So what is true? Well, there's a lot of confusion now. And, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. That's enough. Okay. All right. Problem with DNA chimp and man comp comparisons. The chimp DNA genome used for chimpanzee was incomplete and flawed. Did you know that? It wasn't complete. And it was flawed in certain parts. They picked out what they wanted. They cherry picked. It also was contaminated by human handling. Okay. We see that Dr. Tom, Tom Tompkins at the Institute of Creation Research sampled 25,000 base sequences and found recently with Richard Bogg from the University of London stated the DNA data comparing the chimp with the human was 84.38% correlating with Jeff Tompkins. So it's about that, around 85% comparison, not 99%. And you ready for this? Tompkins also found, and this is known today, that DNA, the DNA data, including humans have 4.5% different DNA from each other. So as a look at the audience, we can take our DNA. We, you're going to be able to trace my origins. You're going to be able to trace where I came from. And you're going to find that I came from Italy. <laughs> because I have two parents that were Italian. One was born in the other country, and the other one came here. So the last one that came here was, was born here. All of them, all his family, my father's family, came from Italy. So I'm, I'm kind of a purebred. You'll check, and I'm pretty sure that's where I came from. <laughs> but it's interesting. You see, four point. We'll see differences there in my my family. We'll, we'll probably see differences, but humankind is four point five percent. Now I need to make this clear. This is just a cartoon, but I've seen many many variations of this, where it almost looks like it's true. You know what I'm saying? But it's not. Every one of them. Every one of them has been an assumption made when they started to put these things together. Teach man is involved with primates as a scientific fact. That's what I learned when I went to college. And imagine it's still being taught today, right? We know that's being taught truly. Now, I just want to, this is kind of what we're talking about next time we meet. We're going to be talking about eight-man fallacies and hoaxes and so on, and we're going to see a video. But take a look at these footprints, Okay. Uh, Mary Leakey found these in 1976. The trial had 70 footprints that were dated 3.7 million years old because of the volcanic ash. They found an area nearby and they dated that rock and they said, okay, these 70 footprints that came here were 3.7 million years old. And they look like human or they look like something. Okay, evolution believed that these footprints were made by the Africanists Australopithecus. Would you like to see Africanus Australopithecus? I'd like to show you that because I went to see uh, Africanus Australopithecus with my wife, Linda. We went to the American Museum of Natural History. I'm going to show you the Cleveland one, and they look the same. See him? See her. Excuse me. We don't know if it's a he or it was a he or she, but Alpha, I'm, I'm Australopithecus Africanus. Lucy, 3.2 million years old a human ancestor, okay? She looks just like the one we went to the human uh, to the American Museum of Natural History in 2000, was it five, I was two or three? I don't remember now. No, it was around, yeah, 2002 or three. No, I know when it was. Linda, it was when we were there a month before 2001, before the 9-11. We were there 8-11. So we were up, we went to the towers before they came down a month before. And I was curious because I got these magazines and my daughter from Scientific American, my daughter would say, dad, these are naked people. And I'm, I'm a creationist and I just want to see what they had. And when I went there, I, 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 they took models of humans and they, they did everything. And so we thought we're at a, um, a nudist college. Just went through the whole room, and it was amazing. I mean, um, Linda wanted to leave right away. Said that, <laughs> anyway, Adam, uh, autonomous have examined footprints and concluded that the modern human, there are modern human made. Now, there's a lot of stories behind this. I'm not going to go through all of them. They said pigs did it, and then finally we got humans. Bottom line is that 
we finally came to the conclusion that humans made those footprints. Next, the footprints were found a thousand miles away from the site where Lucy Australopithecus africanus was discovered. Okay, now that figure there, let me show you something. Let me just say, there is deep-seated uncertainty about the human origins of the scientific experts. We always see this when it comes to humans. The bones of the missing feet and hands are missing yet. This is what Lucy looks like. See it? And there are a few made up bones there. That's a discussion for next time. Um, yeah. So do you see any uh, feet? Who's going to walk? It should be walking. And see the pelvis? That pelvis is not supposed to be uh, if it walked like human, it has to be cup like. That's not cup, it's flat. All right. That's so the Johansson and others forged some things. We found that later there was not much more going on. And that's where Dr. Carl Werner has done his research and has unveiled this to us so we can see it. And we're going to see it soon in May. I'm going to do a short presentation with the film. Walking upright, according to evolution experts, is still in question. This is what they say. Chimp and human. So I found this in the literature. Walking on two legs distinguished the first hominids from other apes. But scientists still aren't sure why our ancestors became bipedal. They have no idea why they became bipedal. They could go get, actually a monkey could go way, go right up on the tree. It's that poor, his hands are like his leg. His hands are like his feet. So he can climb up. He's got strong arms. I mean, if he wanted food, he, he could do it real. But why are we standing up? That's the big question. And we see that as we look at the literature, we see that the pelvis. Now, here's what I was talking about earlier. See, the pelvis is flat. The ilium is flat right back here. We have flat ilium. Okay, that is definitely, that is a, I mean, that is a primate right there. The human is over here. It's, it's very well developed. You can see that it's bowl-shaped. The ilium is bowl-shaped. You can see that it's wider. The pelvis is wider, okay? it's uh, The blades are angled and so on. So big differences as you look at pelvises when you walk bipedal, all right? Also, the the hole in back of our heads, okay, where the, the spinal cord goes up, has to be right in the middle. The gorilla has it all the way on the outside. And so you can see that's good because that's how a gorilla walks. So there are a lot of, we're going to see this in the, the forgeries. They forge that hole so the man could stand up. Anyway, you can see it there. Now, take a look at this. And this is a great illustration. If I had secular students before me and I was teaching anatomy, I put this up and let them see. But for Chimp to be a bipedal walking on two legs like a human, Every bone of its body would have to change to walk upright. Do you, you, do you understand that? Big difference between apes and humans. And we see that as we look at the literature, there must be a significant changes in order to form a new complete branch of species identified as Homo sapiens for evolution to work. The larger conclusion is that humans are the most unique creatures that live on the earth. Evolutionists believe that intelligence evolved from primates. Now, I'm going to go into intelligence a little bit when we talk about this. Humans versus monkeys. Okay, when we talk about intelligence. Okay, again, I got the monkeys in the ground. All right, okay. Difference is so great that there's no comparison. Humans versus intelligence. Yeah, you know, they can do they can do some surprising things, monkeys and primates. They can use tools and all that. But it's a little more complicated. You follow me? Um, to get food with a stick is a little more complicated than a human, much more complicated, because a human will all use all sorts of devices and machinery to be able to accomplish what it needs to do. Intelligence added to adaptation. This is what they believe in. Intelligence and adaptation to the challenge of natural selection is no better or worse than any other adaptation, such as the spread of the cheater uh, to the, or venomous bite of a Cobra. I had a student come in here uh, it was when we were at the other other location at the museum, and he, he was from an atheist background. We had several atheists come in, 
And he used this as, as his way of discussing uh, when we talk about intelligence. He said, animals can be intelligent too. I said, well, how? And he described intelligence by this, that they could adapt and they could do, a cheetah can really run fast. That would be an intelligent quantity. That's not a way I'm talking, I'm not describing intelligence that way. I'm describing intelligence not as a physical aptitude, but more as a, ready for this, mental aptitude that comes from our brain, you follow. We're able to solve problems, use language and so on. The definition of intelligence has changed to a more liberal interpretation, applying millions of years of adaptation. So that's what I learned from this young man, that he, he was taught this. Intelligence was due to adaptation and animals would evolve that adaptation and the, evolve the brain that, that they needed. There's no universally accepted definition of intelligence. I found this out. So what's intelligent? Well, the ability to reason, plan, save, uh, solve problems, think abstractly, comprehend ideas and language and learn. That's the way I would describe it. That's one of the better definitions, right? Uh, the evolution of Muhammad intelligence can be traced over the past 10 million years, attributed to specific environmental challenges. So that's where they propelled. How can human intelligence be traced? There's no way you can trace human intelligence. They use tools. And you're going to see how they manufacture these tools. These tools that we're going to show next month in May, you, you'll see that these tools are, are man-made. They are not, not only man-made, they're just brought in. They're they say, okay, that could be a tool that was rounded and so on. And how do you know it's a tool? Well, it looked like one, you see? So they suppose that. And that's how we got a lot of these tools from these sites. Intelligence um, is intellect, as we call it, an umbrella term used to describe a property of the mind that encompasses many related abilities, such as the capacity to reason, to plan, to solve problems, to think abstractly, and so on. Evolution influences brain size. They believe brain size is important. Eugenics helped this out. Uh, by eugenics, we got the IQ test as one of the, as we brought eugenics into our country. And by, by eugenics, we mean the well born. In other words, you were born with certain traits, and we were going to, we we're going to breed those traits. That's part of the Hitler's eugenics movement. But they learned that from America. And so we looked at maybe working with students at higher IQ tests. And so we developed our IQ tests, right? And so um, they said, well, you know, if you have a big brain, you should be able to handle big things. So the bigger the skull, the more intelligent. Eugenics is a study that separates humans into groups and according to their evolutionary traits, skull size is one of those traits. Normal human brain size was wide variances from 800 cc's to 2200 cc's. Um, I'm sorry about this girls, but men, male, we have 1400 cc's brain size. Female size is 1,300 cc's. But guess what? Brain size doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, we found out the brain size doesn't mean anything. And so this is what we see. We see the evolutionary idea that the smaller the brain, the smaller the skull, the, uh, you would be unintelligent. You would, could not make smart decisions. And so we've seen a lot of this in the literature where the, like the pygmy, would be, and we found pygmies. We found pygmies in, in different sites. And those pygmies supposedly were smaller brains and therefore they were not as intelligent. That was all wrong as we can see. So brain size doesn't work. Brain size has never been proven to link to intelligence. Variation with a thousand cc's has never proven increase or decrease intelligence. Uh, how intelligence is linked to the brain is still a great scientific mystery. Remember, that's where we start moving into the second story. When we talk about mind and brain, you follow me? That's why it's hard to measure intelligence because when you try to measure intelligence, you have to define what it is. But you see that God has given us because we're creating his image, some exclusive, exclusivity. And we are we are, have some uniqueness that, that is unbelievable when it comes to being able to solve problems. For instance, my wife can solve more problems than I can with certain issues. I mean, there were certain things that I would, she would be able to solve them. And I, I like to solve problems. 
but because of her versatility in this area, she's able to solve them. So it kind of makes it very interesting. It should not be taught as a fact in public schools. And this is a very important verse. I love this verse because it tells us where we are right now. Man is without excuse. For the wrath of God is real, real from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth and righteousness because what it may be known about God and manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes has been clearly seen, understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What does that mean? God has manifested himself so that every human being created in God's image can recognize him. Therefore, there shouldn't be any atheist in town. The only atheists that are going to be around are going to be the ones that claim not to be wise. They're going to claim that they are wise. And they have, as I said earlier, they have their own um, religion mentality. Next thing we're going to go into is self-awareness. And self-awareness, um, self-awareness self -awareness deals with being truly human. And I, I need to, this concept came as I was talking to a neurologist, um, a Jewish neurologist, he was a uh, he was part of a temple, but he he was a creationist. He believed in a, he believed in intelligent design, and he just he just he, he blew my mind because as we were talking, we got to this idea of self awareness. So let me let me evolution fails to describe how man's self awareness originated. It didn't come from me. That's exactly right. Uh, scientists define consciousness as being aware of one's body and their environment, while self-consciousness is so much different. Uh, it, it is a complete recognition of one's own self, his own experience. In other words, we can see outside ourselves, right? We can see outside ourselves. No animal can do that. You can see outside yourself and look inside. You have introspective. You can look inside and see what where you are and so on um the, so you, you you recognize it you need to be aware that you are thinking and realize that your own thoughts it's obvious by doing this that you you've gone into a much higher level of awareness so we we see that this is mark uh, swardov uh he's a neurologist down here in south florida he gave me this great concept it's one of his slides here you are and uh, it goes like this. Scientists could not find in the cortex of the brain when stimulated took ownership of a movement. I did that. In other words, when we examine the brain with the idea of activity, had to, we had to stimulate the brain to get the activities and then you, you did it. But here's the problem. How do we get the stimuli to do what we do? You follow me? How do we get the idea? Let's say if I want to walk out the door, right? How do I make that decision? That decision is made where? I call it on the second to third floor. The third floor is the spirit of God. You move into the second floor, that's the mind. You follow? So you have to walk outside. And so part of that, that activity from the brain has to be some de degree of self-awareness. That's very important to understand. So in Genesis 126, it says that we're, the, the plan is that we are to make man uh, like in our image. Genesis 22, uh, 7, the execution, and the Lord made four man from the dust of the ground and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. So we know that God breathed into everything for life, but this emphasis here is that he, in this verse, he distinguishes that he takes man and breathes life into him. Okay, the result continued in 2, 7, and the man became a living being. Our life, our living being, depends on Christ Jesus. That's where we came from, our creator. Into our hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the, the God of truth. Uh, the spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty uh, gives me life. Uh, here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. So we see clearly that the idea of the Spirit moving in us is what makes us connected with God. 
So what are we? Well, there are materialists that say we're just matter. And then there are others that say we can we can be dualistic, meaning that we have a mind and a mind can control us. Where we're today in this world, we were we have a lot of people that want to be spiritual. So they say, I I believe in my own God. You follow me? I believe in my own God. And there, there's a third part of that. That's the spirit. Spirit is darkened because we're creating God's image. Trialism, the tripartite, is where we are. We have the spirit of God because we're creating God's image. Those who do not Christ, that room is darkened. They just move about. They move about in their own sin. Mind, soul is something like you love what's love what's integrity i mean that's in the mind you see we have this is a whole complex thing that dr swara was was demonstrating to me that our mind literally functions in a different plane and it goes beyond that and that's where the third part goes into the spirit of god and that's why we are that way we have a trialism, the idea that we have this three part in us because we're creating God's image. And because we're creating God's image and because we have self-consciousness, we can give names. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, only a human, only if I'm a human, um, only if a human gives me you a name. That's the only way he can give get a name. A monkey can't get a name. He has to be named, doesn't he? He has to be named by you. I've seen this with pets. People get dogs in. What do they name? They name the dog, right? Even I, I've been seeing these adopt, adopted dogs come in and they, well, they, they're out there and they bring them in and rescue them. They give them a name. You see, we give names. Why do we give names? Because we are self-aware of ourselves and therefore our person, because of our, because of the spirit in us, because we are tri trilism. We have the, the the mind, the spirit, spirit of God, the mind, soul, and the body. We are we enhance. We bring them in and name them. Okay, they name me what? Hashtag. The human being has the right to a name. The right to a name. Your children, pets, and anything, uh, any other creature gives us a sense of ownership, and that is described only to mankind. So, what did Adam name? Well, he named his wife. Did he not? What else did he name? Ability of name other animals as a measure of self-awareness. Evolutionists have attempted to explain this phenomenon using the theory that self-awareness originated when hominids began to work together. There is no objective data to support this idea. You follow me? How do you do this? How do you become self-aware? How does it happen? Your brain does it? Ah, it's a little more complicated than that. God created animals for man to have dominion and, com and companionship. That's what it's all about. It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the air. I, animals have the breath of life. All the animals have breath, praise the Lord. That's Psalm 150. Uh, God used the ground dust to form the animals too. Also the plants. Adam named all the animals. Oh, wait a minute. How can Adam name all those animals? Come on, give me a break. That would be a miracle, right? But I go into the idea that we didn't have, what we have today is we have lots of animals, and those animals are spread apart. Think of the dogs and how many dogs we have. God could just name, I mean, Adam just had to name a wolf, and that would have been like all the dogs. And so we had, we had animals following their kind, and all he had to do is name those kinds. And he could have did it in four hours. And so, I mean, seriously, if God brought him the, the animals, it could be done. So, um, yeah, let's go on. So we name our kids, Emma, Noah. So these are the most popular names. Uh, they change every year, so I don't know what. Anyway. Um, and the land for man in the dust of the earth, ground breathed into his nostrils, the breath and life became a living being. We saw that the... Uh, the country from which the dust was taken is not specified, right? Rabbis uh, believed it came from all over the earth, so no one could say, my father is more significant than yours. Is that clear? Okay, because Adam is the proper name for the first human and designation for all mankind. We're all man, we come from the dust of the earth. Using God's name. Think about this. We praise God by his name. 
Okay. So we have the ability to name, we use God, and we know that God's name has to be praised. It says there in the scripture, Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic your name is on all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Scripture is filled with this. Now, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name, give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Therefore, by my hand, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, I'm going to quickly go into another concept. I did intelligence. I did self-awareness, creating God's image. How about language? Think about language. There's our brain. Unbelievable. It, you have a frontal lobe, very big. Frontal lobe is right there. Okay? Very big. Very big frontal lobe. Compared to the other brain, I mean, to compare to other animals, your brain takes takes it. Uh, the ratio of frontal cortex compared to the in, in, entire cerebral cortex is very small in rodents, rats, and mice. Uh, but in cats and dogs, it's only 3.5 to 7% respectively, okay? We go on. The ratio in apes is about 17%, while in humans, we rank away, uh, way ahead to 29%, giving us the highest ratio. So we got to think about that. We have a, uh, a frontal cortex is, is very large. Part of the brain provides tremendous amount of space for information storage and responsible for our personality. So years ago, they used to what? They used to put try to put holes through the eyes and 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 go to the frontal cortex to change personality. And that was eventually that was thrown out. There's nothing happened. Just <laughs> a man is three pound brain, which is as far as we know is the most complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. And Isaac Asimov said this, and he was an atheist. He understood the brain was a complex, unbelievable organism. I'm going to play this little video and you get an idea of what I'm talking about. What do we know about the inner workings of the human mind? Surely everything that humans do, from designing skyscrapers to composing symphonies, is not the product of simple cellular interactions. And yet it might be. Because everything that humans do, or think, or feel, is a result of these basic units of brain structure, the neurons. The human brain contains more than 100 billion neurons. Just like a single ant could never build an anthill, a single neuron can't think or feel or remember. A neuron's power is a result of its connections to other neurons. Each neuron is connected to as many as a thousand of its neighbors. These trillions of connections provide the playing field upon which the complex activity of the brain takes place. Each neuron can turn its neighbor on or off depending on the signal it sends. And the resulting stable patterns of neuron firing represents memories and images and thoughts. We don't yet understand the relationship between neural activity and mental experience. We don't know what the precise pattern of memory or an image or a thought looks like. We don't yet know how to read the cerebral code of the neurons, but progress is being made. We can now watch exactly how various stimuli and memories cause the firing of hundreds of neurons. Perhaps these techniques will allow us to work our way up from the activity of a few neurons to see the structure that emerges from the whole. That's an amazing thing to think about. The neuron sending signals uh, through this complex network. And uh, I just have a little illustration here about neuron connections. Each neuron is in contact with 10,000 other neurons for 100 trillion connections in the brain. So we just figure out if I have this little neuron that's connecting 10,000, uh, and I just do the math, it becomes 100 trillion connections in the brain. If we were to straighten out all these neurological connections in one single line, they would stretch to 100,000 miles. A lot of connections there. 
Very little is known about how these dendrites, those little things that neuron has, little fingers that go out. The dendrites orient themselves and create the interact unique and branching patterns that we see today. Now think about this for a second. Remember I told you about the three-part, you know, we try we are try unity, we're try trialism, tripod tripate. When you look at the idea, and this is the three rooms, you know, we have the spirit of God in us if you believe in Jesus Christ. And that, that comes down and we try to control our mind and heart. We have sin, we have sinful words in a sinful world. So we got the physical over here, and we're trying to deal with all that. We get to heaven, we'll have unity with Christ because the body will leave us. We'll have a unity with our spirit. And I don't know about where the mind fits. That's going to be very interesting. But there's going to be part of us, that person that I believe is going to be still there because it's good, because God created it to be good. So um, I, I, um, I thought that, you know, when a drug addict has to take drugs, think about what happens to the neuron paths. They kind of what, get oriented to drugs and to addiction. And there's chemistry behind it, the whole thing behind it. Think about when I start thinking good thoughts, when I'm mindful of God, what happens to neuron paths? They get connected, don't they? When they get connected, they simply work that way. When I got transformed and I became a new, new creature in Christ, my brain literally changed. It changed. I, my whole perspective of life, not just the glasses, but right in here, it changed. I believe that this is what happens when people become to know Christ. I believe that third compartment interacts and starts to change everything. Now, another comparison. Compared to the body size, one of the most apparent distinctions in the human brain is our relatively large, re, uh, wrinkly cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex is made of gray, spongy-like material that would be equivalent of taking 20 foot by 20 foot tablecloth, squishing it and folding it together, compressing it like a grapefruit. All that surface area would be like our cortex, making it highly convoluted. And I, I try to do that. I try to put this thing together and make all that. But all what happens is the surface space really increases tremendously. And that's where blood flow comes in. Just amazing way our brain is constructed. And then, of course, we have these centers where are talking about language, where we can recognize words coming in. Okay, so we have sounds to hear the sounds. The sounds come in and come to our brain. We have to recognize the sounds. So the brachia helps us do that with verb association. And then the nouns, the nouns give us, a noun is like a, a, a word like man and so on. And then you picture that and you're able to picture it in your brain. Then you have to go through the idea of after you're getting the sentence in, somebody speaks to you, put the sentence in your brain, then you have to respond back. That takes a whole bunch of nerves and endings and so on, neuron connections to make it really work. The brain is very complicated. When you took, took a look at a human brain, when it comes to language, it's very specialized. Acquisition of language. Month, 18 months old, old 20 words. Uh, age uh, two years, 300 words. Age three years, 1,000 words. That's how they, we develop over time. Age five to six, 3,000 to 4,000 words. And so the language is complex. We know this just by our nature. Um, Helen Keller demonstrated this in 1880 to 1868, 1887. Helen Keller learned 30 symbols, 30 words from a Annie Sullivan, a few sh uh, short hours. So the idea, we, we didn't understand this, how words and meaning come together. And in 1887, we saw this unbelievable thing take place, 30 words. Uh, in a few short hours, she was able to, and it just came all of a sudden. You've seen, I don't know if you've seen the movie, Helen Keller, but that, that is an amazing thing. She demonstrated for the first time a remarkable ability of language acquisition. So we know that the brain can think 800 words per minute. Average adult uses 10,000 words and recognizes 30,000 to 40,000 words. My dear Linda has a crossword puzzles and she's asking for all these kind of words. You know, 10,000 words and recognizes 30,000 to 40,000 words. The Webster Dictionary has 400,000 words. It's amazing. Amazing. We got to keep our words going, and maybe the more crossword puzzles might be good, too. <laughs> okay. Linguists have studied overwhelmingly that there are no simple languages, even though there are um, hundreds of languages, without a writing system. 
Languages have phonetic system that built words and they, these words are associated together with a set of, ready for this, rules so you can express a thought in a sentence. They're rules. Remember, you're teaching your kids how to, when you go to school, this is, this, you know, you got to start over with your subject, you got a verb, and you got, yeah, so you got rules, okay? You follow, those, and in any language, there's rules, okay? The ability to make and understand the ultimate number of sentences has been called the creative aspect of language. That alone, this alone shows us that we're human. This alone shows us that we have a special gift. We're creating God's image. It goes on. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Luigi uh, Covelli. And this is, uh, he did a, a, a study on languages, did a complete study. He spent a lot, a good part of his life studying languages. All contemporary modern human beings use very complex languages. There are no primitive languages. You hear that? No primitive languages. The 5,000 or more spoken today are equally flexible and expressive and their grammar and syntax are sometimes are sometimes richer and more precise than that of the most widespread languages like English or Spanish, which have un undergone some simplifications over the centuries. Think about that. Language has to be a gift from God. And the Bible tells us that. It tells us very specifically. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, and all... All and, and um, creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by what? By man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Words mean something. That is an amazing concept. That we can speak language and we can, yes, we can take words and they become deadly poison. They can make, as we see today now with social media, you can put somebody, make somebody commit suicide. That's how dangerous they are. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse man. We have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and also cursing. And as I get to man's distinctiveness and we wind up this evening, I want to just talk to you briefly, and this is just very brief about creativity. We are creative, unbelievable humans. We can create things. We can create paintings. We can create opera. I mean, humans have an ability to change things. Humans have ability to work in colors and sounds. Think about that. We are basically, when it comes to creativity, a wonder, uh, a reflection of God. That's what we are. God has given us this gift of creativity. Now, I know that the animals... I, I, there are animals that can talk like amazing. They can, they can do things that are, they can look beautiful too. They're amazing their own self, but we are the gift of appreciating it. You see, because we're creating God's image. Appreciation of that gift has, is a God thing because we are created in his image. We can appreciate that. We have a moral consciousness. By the way, any one of these moral conscious language are good mechanisms to be able to talk to people who do not believe. Because I think they need to, these are very important things. Where do we get language from? Language is human. It's a human quality. Well, that had to come from God. The ability of moral conscious, ability to decide right from wrong. Uh, one of the famous atheists um, believed that this, I mean, he said that when it came to language, when it came to moral consciousness, it had to be moral conscious. A lot of atheists and bro who come to the understanding of God because of this basic concept of moral conscience. Where do we get the idea of right and wrong from? We know that by the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat, you will become surely you will die, Genesis 2.17. Uh, the depth of human moral consciousness is demonstrated in our legal system and development. We have lots of law, law libraries. The idea of justice for all, integrity to proofness, and honor are words that describe this phenomenon. And then lastly, how about your emotions and your faces? Your faces, I'm looking at the audience here, your faces tell me what you express and how I see some tired faces here today. I know I got to end, but I, I, the, the idea of faces, the facial changes used to magnify your emotional depth is amazing. Uh, you know, we have this kind of thing. You don't see belly buttons. You don't see, you see faces. What kind of animal can you dig? Can you say that I can identify this thing with a face? 
I mean, we have very distinct faces because we really have the ability to move the faces and to express emotional depth, ability to feel pain and joy is much more intense than any other animal. The ability to internalize the whole emotion of well-being, brain studies indicate that the deep part of the brain, that's where it comes from, to internalize emotion. Uh, we, we really are emotional creatures. By emotion, I mean we dig down deep. Think about words and what, what kind of emotions they put on us. The human face can emote a quarter of a million facial changes that are controlled by 28 paper-thin muscles. Okay, there are the 28 thin muscles, and this is the chimpanzee. Okay, you, chimpanzee. Chimpanzee has got a lot fewer than you, because why? You emote muscles. The chimp is not smiling. He's showing that his teeth, his teeth, because he is angry. Oh, that my chimpanzee smiling. No, no, no. He's angry. Animals have a limited number of emotions, such as rage, excitement, fear, and contempt while humans have many more. How many people have pets? You have dogs, motion. You'll see some emotions with dogs. Cats, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know about the others, but they have something, okay, but not like you. Look at all the emotions you can express with your face, okay? Emotions, original six emotions were identified. Happiness, sadness, surprise, fear, and anger, and disgust, okay? Psychological uh, Robert Bolchek, he came up with 90 different kinds of emotions and gave us an emotional wheel. Here you go. And you can see this gets really complex. By the way, our mind leads us to our emotions, right? It's what we think is what we emote. Think about that for a second. Go back to the brain cells and how we coordinate because we're creating God's image. We literally have the power. Remember how... So how do you get self-conscious? How do you know? How do you how do you move? It's God's spirit that moves. The consciousness is what God has given me. It all makes sense. It makes so much sense that I conclude with this. And this is how I just end it off. We're creating God's image so we can worship him and have a relationship with him. He died for us. He rose from the dead. He gave us this beautiful creation. So he can be magnified and we can see him. Then he created us in his image. And then he's seeking for us to have a relationship for him. We worship him as we see him. Thank you. We'll end it with a prayer and then we'll open the questions. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We acknowledge you, Jesus. We know that you're here, that you've given us this beautiful uniqueness. And in your precious name we pray. Amen. Any questions? You know, so much of this depends on worldview. <clears throat> the worldview you have, if you look at the chimp, even if you've got 80% of the same DNA that we do, I mean, if the worldview was that he evolved, they evolved from the common ancestor, that's what you look at. If you believe he evolved, he uh, was created, by God, you will realize that that's that the similar DNA is because we exist in a similar world, right? And we have functions that, that are similar. So, so let me let me mind. let me. I, I want to summarize this because the listening audience, I think, can pick you up, right, Johnny? I think my mic picked him. Okay. Okay. So, um, what you're saying is, it's depending on our worldview. Our worldview moves us in the direction we move. And this is where I'm talking about when I say worldview. I'm talking about understanding the truth of Jesus, right? And then our worldview propels us to what we believe in. Right. We all have the same we, And we have the same kind of basic makeup, don't we? Same evidence. Yeah, same evidence. Right. But the DNA, 84%, as you said, we've got the same DNA. And look how we're coming to different conclusions. Right? So that kind of puts us in the category that we're able to take these things in from a worldview perspective and turn them out in a very different way. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? So elephants should 
be more intelligent than we are because they have a huge brain. I agree. But that's not so. <laughs> Johnny, any questions online? We're good. Okay. Thank you very much. Johnny, is there a right to end it here? Okay. Thank you very much for your um, for your attention today. We praise God that um, he'll be with you as I prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll end it in.